Good morning once again. Humility, prayer, and turning. Yeah, those three words are used in one scripture. Can you identify it? Well, we're going to come to it a little bit later. Yes, humility, prayer, and turning. It's in the Old Testament. But some of the same words are used in the New as well. So um, this is a beautiful city I uh, visited many times, Nelson, B.C. And if you have uh, traveled much, you know that in different cities that you may be driving your vehicle in, you need to be especially alert to, and this is in Canada, so um, things are similar, but they're different as well. So you have to pay attention in the intersections because when you come to an intersection, somebody has the right of way and others in the intersection may not have the right of way, correct? In a city, you have all kinds of vehicles, um, buses, emergency vehicles, uh, pedestrians, a lot of bicycles here in this town. I've even ridden in the snow and ice on those streets with a special bike that was loaned me. So in these intersections, um, there's basically uh, typically four directions of travel. You can go straight ahead. You can, if you have a green light, right, there's a stoplight. Uh, you can go left if you have the right of way, or you can go right in many situations. One direction you're not supposed to go is in reverse without doing the appropriate U-turn around the block or whatever it, it takes. Um, and those who violate those rules of the road too many times end up standing before the judge. And in some cases, they have to pay for restitution for damages they've incurred to others. And then if it happens too many times, the judge is going to say, guess what? Um, I'm pulling your license. You can no longer drive behind the wheel. I witnessed one of those cases um, in court and out of court. Um, once traveling, and this was in Southern California, and I probably told some of, the, some of you may hear, remember this story. But in brief, I'm traveling at 55 in a semi loaded, and I see an accident coming. Someone is running through the, res the intersection at high speed through a red light. They collide with another vehicle. They're spinning in the intersection. I'm coming through. Well, I was able to slow down a little bit and change lanes and not hit either one of those two vehicles. I knew they would not sur probably survive if I did hit them. The one individual probably had to give up his license for running a red light at high speed. I didn't go to court to find out. But you know what? There's people out here in real life who are violating the rules of biblical life, how we're supposed to live it, creating wrecks in society, wrecks in their homes. They miss their turns. Some of these people are just walking aimlessly about, not paying any attention to what's going on around them. They're focused in the wrong direction. And they will cause a, a tremendous uh, hardship for themselves or somebody else by their mistakes or their neglect because they're focusing on the wrong thing. When Jesus came to this earth, he brought focus back to the people in the right direction to what's really most important. So let's open our Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. And let's go, we're going to be in the story, or the passages we're going to be reviewing, begin in Mark 1, 1. But we're not going to read the whole portion here, 1 through 14. We're going to focus on some key verses. Starting with verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time has come. 
the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So from one end of the Bible, from one end to the other of the Bible, the message of turning or repenting is, is given many times. And to repent, defined through the Hebrew and Greek, implies a change in direction. What we just read are actually the first recorded words of Jesus in the New Testament. So repent has some other implications as well. It can mean to think differently or reconsider, especially morally. And here's a big word, what it means as well, to feel compunction, meaning to contemplate and repent. It means to turn. In Acts, uh, Peter told his audience on one occasion, mainly the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, you killed Jesus and you need to repent. And then you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the, the question I asked earlier, where are the three words found? Here it is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The first element here it mentioned is humility. You see, even believers can turn down the wrong path and take the wrong course. And so, true repentance or turning requires an action of some kind, not just an assent in thought. So it implies that, this verse implies that the individual or the nation in this case, or a group of people, is to turn or move away from habitual sin. So there are some other reasons why there may be cause to turn from what we are doing. And that might be the consequences of our choice or action that we're planning to take. And all through the Bible, we've, we can study that there are people or individuals who suffered some very uncomfortable circumstances for the poor choices or the sinful actions they had taken. You see, God wants us to miss out on those bad consequences, doesn't he? However, that shouldn't be the only reason we're willing to turn from a life of sin. In Isaiah 6, uh, 1 through 5, you turn with me there, the uh, prophet Isaiah has some strong remarks to make in his encounter with God. 6, 1 through 5. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, and two he covered with face his face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
What a privilege Isaiah had to see the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And even the cherubims um, who are sinless cover their faces with their winks. How, how much more should we be humble in front of our King, who is Lord of Lords? Holy, 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 defined in the Hebrew means to be undone. When Jesus came to this world, he came to make us holy by accepting him as Lord of life. Repentance is defined as continually being undone, emptied of self. Paul, um, when he was on trial before King Agrippa in Acts 26, Paul had already gone through another trial or two, actually a few trials. So I'm going to turn there to the book of Acts, invite you to do so as well. And uh, so I've been studying, my wife and I, studying the life of Paul through the Acts of the Apostles and the Book of Acts, reminded of what a dedicated soldier he was for the Lord. Paul had gone up to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church, to bring a large donation from the Gentiles. And he knew that in going to Jerusalem that he would be harassed by his own people. But he went anyway, and he didn't even know if he was going to be able to return from there without being stoned to death. So he was arrested there in Jerusalem by the Jews for preaching Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord. From there, he appealed. And then he went before, first of all, he was escorted, escorted to Caesarea, and he stood trial before Felix, Festus, and then King Agrippa. So this is where we're going to pick up the story in Acts 26. And Agrippa says, um, go ahead, speak. What do you have to say? Speak for yourself. See, Paul was his own attorney. So he told in verse 2, Actually, you know what? That's the wrong. I'm in the wrong chapter. We'll get to 26. And um, 26 1. Agrippa says, Okay, Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. So he stretched out his hands and answered for himself. He says, I think myself happy. Here he is in chains, and he says, I'm happy. King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg of you to hear me patiently. The Jews had accused him, Paul, of preaching Christ the resurrected and that the only way to receive salvation and this is a new concept to some people who knew or witnessed Christ on the cross, crucified. And now Paul's saying he's, Jesus is the creator and the redeemer and to worship him. And the Jews took great offense at that. But Paul was persistent. And the Lord used this occasion to witness before kings and magistrates about the greatness of Jesus Christ as Lord. I'll drop down to verse 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. 
For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. He went on to explain that on the road to Damascus, verse 12, he says, while I was thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. We all fell to the ground, he says. I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, verse 15, who are you, Lord? Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 16, but rise and stand on your face. On your face. Excuse me, on your feet, misspelling there. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people. Did that happen? Yes, they were. he was delivered from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Here's the key point here, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn, we heard that word turn before a few times, haven't we, by now? To turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The purpose is to turn and the benefit is, is that they will be turned, when a person chooses to turn, they will be turned from the power of Satan to the power of God. Receiving forgiveness of sins. Verse 17, it's on the screen here, I will deliver you from the Jewish people. Yes, that happened. To whom I now send you. To open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Verse 20. But declared first in those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. See, in every generation, in every land, the true foundation for character building in an individual has always been the same. They are the principles found within God's Word. It's the only sure rule of life, the guidelines for doing God's will. It was the word of God that the apostles met with false theories that came their way and in their day. In uh, Psalms 19 and 8 and 15, 5, the statutes of the Lord are right, and he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And in 1 Corinthians 3.11, we're told that other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, meaning through Jesus Christ. At the time of their conversion and baptism, the Colossians, who Paul had worked diligently with, they pledged themselves, once they became Christians, to put away beliefs and practices that had been a part of their lives in the past. And to be true to the true God and be allegiant to Jesus Christ. 
So Paul, in his letter, reminded them of this, entreating them not to forget what the priority is. And he kept his pledge that what Jesus called him to do on that road to Damascus, he would fulfill in ministering to the Jews and then the Gentiles. If ye then be risen with Christ, he said, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know, the counsel here is, for that generation, is really the same, no different, right, for our generation. Setting our affection on things above, <clears throat> not on things on the earth. You know, sometimes that's a challenge, isn't it? Uh, there's a lot going on in this world. And uh, we are living here. We are to occupy till he comes. And so with our affections, this morning I challenge you, where are they? Are they on the things above? Or are you more, fo more focused on getting along in this life with the comforts that we all seem to enjoy? Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, it is only through the power of Christ that a human being, man or woman, can break the chains of sinful habits. A human being, once renouncing selfishness, will be focused on the things above. This change that takes place in the heart of man or woman is really the miracles of miracles. Romans 5.1 says, Being justified by faith, he has peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that perhaps one of the most desirable aspects that we can ever have is peace with God and self and our fellow human beings? You see, if you have determined that you are going to pursue entrance into that spiritual kingdom, you will find that the powers and the passions of an ungenerate nature within us will be kept alive, backed by the forces of darkness. But if you have given yourself wholly to the Lord, those tendencies that are within us, do they just kind of just uh, never rise up again? No, they rise up their ugly head periodically because the power of the enemy, he focuses on those who have committed their lives to Christ and he wants to annoy you. He wants to persecute you. And if all is well with you, peace and safety, well, woe is you. The enemy looks for targets. And those targets are those who are walking with Jesus. Our old habits, our hereditary tendencies, anybody have those? Oh yeah, we have old habits. We have hereditary tendencies to do wrong. They strive for the mastery, we're told, in God's word. And so we must be ever on guard, striving in the strength of Christ for victory. Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore, 
put to death your members which are on the earth. Now they're listed here what those uh, items are supposed to be put to death, right? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Ooh, there's the consequences. The ultimate consequences, which are not good. He goes on to say in Colossians that we once walked and lived in these categories. But now, as Christians, we are to put off a few things. He says in verse 8, if you're there, uh, Colossians 3, 8. Um, put off anger, wrath, malice. You almost need a dictionary to look up the real meaning of some of these words. Blasphemy. Put that off. Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, verse 9, since you have put off the old man and his deeds. And now he tells us on verse 10 what to put on. You know, if you're going to change your garments, you usually have to take something off, right, before you can put something on. Nine, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you've put on new, a new man, verse 10, who is renewed in knowledge according to the thing, no, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, but Christ all in all. And verse 12 tells us to put on those that are the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Now, I know we just like to take a pill, and we have those. That would be our nutritional supplement. It's not that easy, folks. Um, maybe the the supply from this to, to behave this way with kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering is to spend time in the Word regularly. Remember the, uh, what Isaiah said? He says, I'm undone, uh, woe, my unclean lips. And he felt uncomfortable almost in the sight of God because he was so greatly humbled with his human sinful condition. And verse 13 says, Bear, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, oh, we don't do that here, do we? Mm. All's love and happiness, right? No, we tend to complain, sometimes against one another. But if somebody has a complaint, remember that Christ forgave you. And you also must forgive others. Uh, moving on to 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Oh, that's sweet. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Can I have an amen to that? Amen. Goes on to say that the, the word of God is to dwell in us richly. How's it going to do that? unless we spend time in this wor uh, word, verse 16. We're to sing with psalms. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So the letter to the Colossians is filled with lessons of the highest value, especially to those of you who are engaged in doing God's work. So there is a lesson for us in this experience of Paul's. For it teaches us God's way of working. Paul had won many to the faith, thousands, as a free man. 
So when he became incarcerated for years, by the way, from place to place to place, it seemed like his ministry was going to be shut down. But was it? No, because God's word is not chained. You know, when misfortune or calamity comes our way, aren't we ready to charge God with some neglect or cruelty? Lord, you didn't hear my prayer. I'm suffering. Um, why is this going on and on? And Paul could have looked at it that way, but he didn't. What if the Lord sees fit to cut off our usefulness in some way, some, some line of activity? We tend to pout and get discouraged, don't we? But, you know, God works through chastisement, doesn't he? Isn't that how we do with our kids sometimes when they're young and raising them? You see, we need to learn that chastisement is part of God's great plan. And under the rod of affliction, the Christian may sometimes do more for the master than when engaged in active service without persecution. Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is where we need to... Uh, take it to heart this morning. Each one of us has to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we cannot do that in our, our own strength. You know that, right? We need the power that works from within, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The work of gaining salvation is a partnership. It's one of co-partnership, actually. It's a joint operation. There's to be a cooperation between God and the repentant sinner. But when we are wholly dependent upon God for success, he will work in us to transform us. See, God works and man works. How we work is to resist temptation. We must do that. But we must draw the power from God Almighty himself. You see, on the one side, there's infinite wisdom and compassion and power. On the other side, in the human being, we are weakness, we are sinfulness. We are actually absolute helplessness. But God has a goal for us, and that is that we have mastery over ourselves. He will work with us only with our consent and cooperation. The divine works through us with power that he makes available to us. Of ourselves, we're not able to bring ourselves, our desires, our inclinations into harmony with the will of God at all. But if we are willing, we will be made willing through surrender to Jesus. Another scripture here, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So if you've walked in the flesh in the past, we can forget that. Amen? And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See, Paul said, Paul said I count not myself to have apprehended, meaning he had not arrived to perfection. 
I don't care how many years you've been a Christian. Have you, have you perfected? Have you arrived? No. We're told that the work of sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And you're still breathing. Thank goodness. Let us, therefore, press to the mark of the high price. Whatever that calling God has on your life, let's fulfill it in his strength. Amen.